All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the presentation about finding funding for your mobile free-to-play game. Uh, of course, the subtitle is Navigating Treacherous Seas. Um, as most of you must know, it's very difficult these days to find funding for mobile free-to-play games. Uh, the market is very saturated and it's also uh, very competitive. So we're gonna try to look at some options of how to get some funding and hopefully, hopefully this will be interesting for you guys. So let's start about who I am. Uh, yeah, my name is Louis René Auclair. I am chief writer at Rocket Ride Games. Obviously, as many of us, uh, the COVID situation has changed us quite a bit. So this is an old picture, uh, which I will have to refresh because I am much, much, much hairier right now. Um, so my expertise, I have 20 years background uh, in video games. I did retail. I used to run a studio in Montreal, Canada. I also did accessories. I did production at Electronic Arts. So I've been in the industry for quite some time now. And uh, most importantly for, for this talk, I've been in the biz dev role for the past, I would say 15, 15 years. Um, my previous studio was called Hibernum Creations located in Montreal, a studio of about 160 people uh, for which we generated about $60 million worth of business over a span of uh, six to five years. Right now, Rocket Ride, what we do, we're an agency. Our goal is to work with studios all around the world to help them get better pitches, better games, better prototypes, better demos, uh, work with them on production to try to find the best uh, set of features and the best uh, strategy for their game. And finally, we also help for self-publishing for people who like to self-publish. We're a team of 13 people located all over the world. Everybody's remote, not just because of COVID, but because we've been remote since the beginning. And uh, we've been going on for three years now. So that is who Rocket Ride uh, game is. We consider ourselves a boutique consulting agency, like I said, and uh, we work with 41 clients around the world at the moment. So to get things started, I'd like to, to look a bit at history, right? What, what happened in the past? How was it 10 years ago in the mobile free-to-play market? How did people get funding? What people did even like, I mean, before that. So I really like this uh, quote from uh, Antoine Lavoisier uh, that of course shows that I'm French, if you did not know that ahead. Um, nothing is lost, nothing is created, everything is transformed. So a lot of people, they come up with a game idea, they come up with a game feature idea, with a marketing strategy, with a, um, a, even a uh, business model strategy and they think they just reinvented the wheel. Uh, unfortunately, um, most of the business model, most of the game features, most of the um, game concepts have been done in the past. They, they've existed in different ways, shape or form. And what we're doing is we're trying to adapt them to today's market. So <clears throat> when you do a game, when you pitch to somebody, that, that could be one of the good advice is be very certain that it's new and innovative or never before seen before you mention those things because there's a chance that somebody in the room has worked at another company that they already had that feature, already had that game concept, or even that business model. So the examples I wanna show about this is the business models, they go round and round. And you know, coin operated arcades to shareware, things have been there before us. And if you look at the way arcades used to work in the 80s, right, with the, the, the quarters or the dollar or the $2, depending on how old or young you are, um, this is very similar to hyper casual games. Hyper casual games, you don't put a quarter in your phone because it doesn't work, but you watch an ad to continue to play. So very fun, engaging meta games and core loops and very simple, uh, but very easy to lose and you lose super fast. So you want to play again. And how do you play again? You either start over or you continue and you can continue by watching an ad. And, and back then it was uh, adding more and more quarters. Who doesn't remember going to the local arcade with $20 and playing an hour, just $20, $20 right? So uh, times have changed, but there's always been uh, that, that system out there, that, that way of monetizing the player. And same thing for premium games. I mean, who doesn't remember receiving a, a gaming PC magazine with a disc of Commander Keen in it or Doom or uh, Wolfenstein 3D and this being you know, the first disc and you have to connect, uh, you have to uh, order the other ones to continue to play. And all of a sudden you, it's free to play, free to start, 
but then you have to pay money afterwards. So what I'm saying here is you can look to the past for the way some certain things have been done, whether it's game design, whether it's core loops, meta loops, whether it's business models, and you can look at how it's been adapted to today. Or if you're lucky and it hasn't been done, you can find some innovation in some USP for your pitch. So um, let's look at some historical key moments of recent mobile free-to-play. Uh, I don't want to be launching debates of which game was the first free-to-play game on mobile or this and that. All I want to look at is the key well-known points of how it started. And, and it's pretty interesting because it it's emulates what happened on PC with the shareware then moving to MMOs. Uh, you can see the same thing on mobile. So Angry Birds um, in 2009 came out and Angry Birds was free to play. You could uh, play the first levels and after that you had to spend money to download the rest of the game and play the other levels. Cut the Rope was very similar and those two companies on mobile became juggernauts, right? They became huge companies that are now still successful. Um, I remember when Angry Birds came out, I was a producer at Electronic Arts uh, working on Scrabble and we had Scrabble uh, for the phone and we were working on Scrabble iPad. And what I remember is we were selling it at $5.99 back then and Scrabble was in the top 10 constantly. So Scrabble and Tetris were four and $5.99 games that were being the top grossing and top downloaded games on the App Store. Uh, back then, I mean, on a daily basis, you would make $25,000 and you would be super excited. Uh, those were the top numbers and you were very happy with them. And, and we were really happy because we had the brand, right? We had the brand of Scrabble and the brand of Tetris. And we felt that with that, we could sell for four, five, six, even seven ninety nine. dollars We were working on upcoming games and we wanted to price them close to $10. Uh, Angry Birds comes out, Cut the Rope comes out. Then all of a sudden you're fighting against games that are giving it for free and then 99 cents to finalize the purchase of the game. Um, but it was very difficult to make that transition because you have to kind of jump in the pool first and be like, okay, we're going to go in there. We're making tremendous amount of money on our games and all of a sudden we're going to give them away for free. So it took a long time for bigger companies to adjust. One of the fads that I really liked back then and I still laugh at it, uh, you can see there in uh, 2010, 2011, uh, the Angry Birds HD version. Um, that was when it came out on iPad. And then you could add a dollar to your retail price. So uh, Angry Birds was 99 cents to, to finalize the purchase. But on HD, uh, on iPad, it was $1.99. And we did the same with Scrabble. So it was very interesting to see how people, it was very interesting to see how people would actually use uh, the, the bigger screen and the biggest quality uh, uh, devices to try to increase the price of their transaction. I think the, the major change, the major shift happened when uh, a game like Candy Crush came out. Uh, King, and, and that's a very interesting thing. Uh, King was being forced to change and transition their business model because of a company known as Zynga that was doing a lot of money on Facebook. Uh, Zynga had games like Farmville and Cityville and, and these games were gathering all the users on Facebook and King was a portal company at that time and, and nobody was coming on their portal anymore because they were using Facebook for the games. So they had to change and, and they didn't know how to do this so they decided to go mobile first and mobile free to play first. So they came out with Candy Crush with a beautiful sand, a saga map an infinite number of levels that you have to buy energy to play. Uh, all of a sudden, they created the, the juggernaut that is King Today and the Candy Crush Saga uh, lineup of games. And at the same time, at that time from, from Japan, Gung Ho with their game Puzzles and Dragons came out on a worldwide basis. Uh, it is said that in those years, so 2012, uh, Gung Ho just in Japan was making $3 million a day in revenue with the game. Uh, so all of a sudden, everybody started paying attention to mobile and everybody wanted to jump in. We'll see a bit about how the transition from that historical moment went into creating the pitches and creating the new games of that uh, era. Uh, but Puzzles and Dragons and Candy Crush are highly regarded as the games that really switch everything to free-to-play on mobile. 
um, later that year, or I think early 2013, a company called Supercell came out with two games, Heyday, which was basically a Farmville kind of clone, uh, but for mobile, and uh, Clash of Clans came out. Um, very interesting story. Clash of Clans was a very similar game to a game called Backyard Monsters on Facebook, which I played a lot back then. And Clash of Clans came out with an amazing art style, great branding, great strategy, simple gameplay, easy to play on mobile. But all of a sudden, just because it had switched and tweaked all these things and tweaked the economy, it became the juggernaut that it is today. And then you could see the fast follows, right? So Game of War came out in 2000, late 2013. As you remember, those were the days of fighting uh, between Clash of Clans and between Game of War, where people were spending 80 to 90% of revenue back on advertising to gather all the users. And all the conversations, all you would talk about at GDC or at any conference were these two games fighting it out for number one position in the highest grossing games. It took a long time uh, before they had any competition on the, at the top, at the very, very top. And this came in the form of Pokemon Go, which uh, came in with innovation. So uh, for the first time, there was a tremendous, um, not for, for the first time, but for a very notable first time, uh, you could see that Pokemon Go came in with very innovative gameplay, that AR as aspect of walking uh, outside and, and using your phone camera to, to catch them all. So that was very interesting how that changed. And of course, now in 2017, we all know how prevalent Fortnite is. I'm not going to talk about the recent situation, but let's consider the PUBG and Fortnite on mobile like a very important uh, update of uh, how to monetize on free to play on mobile. So this is a very simple history, but you can see the makings of, of a cycle of uh, nothing is created, everything is transformed because there are games that are similar from other platforms. There are monetization models that are similar as well. So it's very important to know your history, to know where you can go. So what did publishers expect at that moment? Right, so here's a brief evolution of what they would expect through the years. And by the way, um, a lot of people will say, oh, it was so much easier back then. I don't think it was easier. I think it was potentially more accessible to get deals earlier on. Today, there's a lot of competition. It's very difficult, uh, but you can see the evolution and that evolution is going now to PC and Steam, to, to console games and lower budgets, higher budgets, even in hyper casual, you can see those trends repeating themselves. Uh, so in the early 2010s, when I personally started pitching mobile games, um, basically the way they worked is they did category research and market share potential analysis. Meaning you look at the categories and you see, wow, um, there's nobody in racing or, oh my God, there's nobody in simulation. All right. What's the market share potential in those genres? You evaluate properly. You do a couple of extrapolation, go, you pitch a new game. Now at that time, since it's a blue ocean, there's nobody in there. Just finding and an uniqueness is enough of a differentiating factor. So invest heavily in games and, and move fast to the market. And when I say heavily, back then the budgets, you know, three to $400,000 was, was considered a pretty big mobile game uh, at that time. So uh, the invest heavily is more at the speed than at the budget size, because as we know today, the budgets are much higher. Uh, so it was high demand, few competitors in those days in the early 2010s. Mid 2010s, competition started coming. Like you remember, we looked at this year. So you have Game of War out, you have Clash of Clans. And now what's happening, unfortunately, is everybody's coming with, I have the next Clash of Clans. I have the next Heyday. I have the next Game of War. I have the next Pokemon Go. And people wanted to pitch on a fast follow strategy. A lot less innovation. Uh, changing the art style, changing the theme, changing uh, things like that. Uh, we thought, and it, I, it, it was uh, for a little while, it, we thought it was enough to just go in and compete. Um, that was before the competition went all the way up to, uh, you know, $20 CPIs. But uh, so at that time, what you do is you, you, the, the publishers would surveil the, co the competition. So basically you look at who's doing what, who's doing well doing that and how can you fast follow? How can you 
just upgrade a couple things, change the theme? How can you just differentiate yourself enough to capture some of that market? That's where companies like Supercell and, and Machine Zone started aggressively buying all the users in the categories because they had the revenue and they had the ability to bring those users in. And then the cost of opportunity to change for a user was so high that if I spent $200 in Clash of Clans, I don't want to play another game that's similar to that, but with Vikings, right? It's too much of an investment. So that's why the user acquisition was super aggressive in the mid 20s and then the mid 2010s. So very high demand, very high competition. And now all of a sudden people are starting to look at KPIs. And I remember those days when KPIs started as discussions and people were talking about the day one retention and they were talking about their ARP DAO and ARP POO and all that stuff. And, and every time you would go to a conference, people would add KPIs they talk about just to you know, keep it fresh, maybe sound a little smart and, and, and talk about a different way of winning. Uh, because at that time, it's all, all that mattered is finding a way to win with some KPI, with some sector of the market to really gather uh, the steam and the user base. And now in the late 2010s to today, right? So 2018, 19, and 2020, extremely high KPIs and sophisticated analysis. I mean, right now people are looking at KPIs, you know, six months down the road. What will they be and will, how will they affect my launch? So, so you're talking about longer soft launch. You're talking about extremely high budgets. I mean, some games right now are being uh, done externally at $5 million uh, on mobile and internally the big studios, they're spending 10, 12, $15 million just on the development of the game before being able to spend marketing, which will be very similar amounts. So a launch game of a AAA mobile studio can cost say, upwards of $25 million with the marketing. So you gotta be aware of that and willing to compete with that or find a way to differentiate yourself. At that stage, IP becomes very important. In the mid 2010s, IP was super important as well, but it was easy. You could much easier generate revenue and profits from an IP game. But today it's not only about having an IP, it's having the right IP uh, for the right game, knowing that it's going to cost you a lot of money, but it still diminishes your risk uh, of having a profitable game. Let's tell a personal story of how we won a pitch at, at, Rock, at Hibernum, not Rocket Ride, at Hibernum when we were running the studio. Um, we, we did a pitch for Magic the Gathering Puzzle Quest. And I think uh, there's three key takeaways that I want you to, to keep from that is it's always someone's most important pitch, right? There's a group of people pitching <clears throat> an RFP or to a publisher. There's somebody in that group that this is their savior, their number one pitch or their most interesting game concept they've ever made and they want to win it so much. <clears throat> so that studio who wants to win it so much is going to do everything they can. And on Magic the Gathering Puzzle Quest, that was our situation. We, we had the chance to pitch as a studio. We had never made a major free-to-play game yet on mobile. We were, we were dabbling in them. We were doing some good pitches, good games, but never something in that vicinity of size. And we were appro approached by D3P, uh, publisher at that time, D3Go now, and they wanted to do a follow-up to their game, Marvel uh, Puzzle Quest. So they had acquired a license, Magic the Gathering, and they were asking uh, studios to pitch. And we were the last studio allowed to pitch and they considered us and, and they shared that to, with us at the end. They were considering us as not even backups, but as a, a benchmark. So let's see what Hibernum can do, but I don't think we're going to pick them. They're going to be, you know, benchmark to see how the rest are really good or not good at all. So what they didn't count on is that our team at Hibernum at the time was extremely passionate about Magic the Gathering. So we had a creative director that was in love with the game uh, since, you know, the mid nineties and he started working on a pitch. And as we worked on the pitch, we were, you know, playing the magic, the gathering in the office and evaluating the concept and testing the concept with uh, play patterns and all that. Uh, and it started to become 
quite apparent that we had a good chance of winning this. And uh, our art team was doing some art. And then what we decided is to go all in. So it was our number one pitch. We wanted to go all in. We started making two videos. One video was uh, a fake gameplay footage. So we faked the game scene, we faked cards, we faked everything, made a video of that, sending with our pitch. So all of a sudden they could see the production quality we wanted to hit and what we wanted to do with the game. And furthermore, we did a passion video, basically doing interviews with our team, asking them, why do you love Magic the Gathering so much? Why does it matter so much to you to make a game on Magic the Gathering? And, and we pre prepared that full package, most important pitch, sent it in. And three months later, we finally won this pitch. So another thing is it always takes longer than you think. So no matter how fast you want something to sign, it's always going to take longer than you want it. Even though this publisher wants it, he, he's go ready to go. You know, you have to clear with your legal. You have to clear with Magic the Gathering. You have to clear with us. You have to clear everything. You have to clear maybe with your, um, with, with your bigger company. You know, uh, you have to clear the budget. You have to, I mean, there's always a million things that can go wrong. So um, it's never over till it's over until it's signed. And it's always going to take longer. So we have to be aware of that. And, and the other one, the other key takeaway was focus on your strengths and be open about your weaknesses. Uh, that's something that we were very open with them um, when we were pitching. So our strength at Hibernum at the time was art, uh, was a game design on a meta level, not on a free-to-play level. So we clearly said, look at how amazing the art can look. Look at how great the design is and how thoughtful we are about all the design aspect. Unfortunately, on the free-to-play, we're going to need help. Where We have this plan. We're mitigating that risk that way. And that allowed us to uh, really bring in uh, the best team possible for this. And we mitigated that risk with them, signed the deal, ended up working with uh, D3Go for about three and a half years with this game before we had to close on the company, unfortunately. Uh, but that game generated quite a bit of revenue for the company and it was a, a great partner. So really important, some key takeaways here uh, to remember. So circle back to today, what are publishers looking for? So you want to pitch, you want to know what they're looking for because you want to offer them that, right? I mean, you want to be in a place that you can say, Hey guys, I, I check all the marks, all the boxes. I got everything you need. So today uh, I, cause, I consider this creating a perfect storm. If you are in a place that you're going to win a pitch with a major mobile publisher, that means that you've created a perfect storm with, uh, your KPIs and your IP that you're working on with your experience on the team and individuals. And of course you are able and willing to share some of the risk with a publisher. So those are three points that are extremely important and it's very rare that you're going to be in the middle there and that you're everything, right? You have the best team that did great games that generated money. Uh, you, that team is working still together on the project then um, you either have your KPIs and your IP if you're uh, pitching your own game. Of course, if you're an RFP, then the way you're gonna treat the IP and the way you expect KPIs or your past KPIs from your past game show that you can do it. And then risk sharing. Uh, like I said earlier on, publishers now are gonna be willing to spend four or five million dollars uh, to launch a game. And at the same time, the marketing after you've managed to get it to launch is going to be another four or five million dollars on that month. So um, in a relationship that you're going to be spending, hopefully, six years with a publisher working on the same game, at worst case, production plus launch, which is maybe two years, uh, you got to be able to show that you're going to take some of that risk with them. And that risk can be in multiple facets, right? It can be in, uh, you know, reducing your rates. It can be in uh, having tax credits that you can provide. It can be in, I'm the one who generated the IP and my name is on that deal. It can be in, oh, I have this deal for Asian market that can reduce the risk for the game. And we can already have a publisher that's involved in that market that will generate more revenue for everybody. It can be in securing platform deals anything that you can do to reduce 
the risk for the publisher and take some on your side will show them that you're going to be the partner that they want to have for this game. So when you're in that middle spot, when you have all of that, I mean, the question arises is why do you need a publisher, right? You have everything you're in. It's perfect. Um, so at that time, it's about how much risk can you take? It's about are you really good at publishing? Because publishing is just as hard as making a game. So uh, people think that, hey, if I have everything, I can self-publish. Uh, rarely will it have the same impact as working with a publisher because uh, publishers, that's what they do. They ship games. They put them on the market. They test KPIs. They test marketing strategy. So they come in with a baggage of experience that is lesser uh, risk to you uh, because you're going to have to do a lot of trial and error if you want to self-publish while they have probably already done that on another game. So um, I, I am very uh, rarely a pro self-publisher uh, person. It really depends of how much risk you're willing to take and your ability to take that risk over a long period of time while you wait to learn through your mistakes and through your gathering of experience. So uh, a good position to be in is spot A, which is, you know, you have a great team with experience. They're still working at your company and working together. You're assigning them to that game with the publisher. You have great KPIs because you're in soft launch and you have great IP because you built your IP or because you managed to get the IP pre-publishing uh, deal. Then all of a sudden, you might be able to be a bit picky and say, you know what, I'm not going to share any risk. Uh, of course, if you don't share any risk, you cannot expect to have a higher percent of the percentage of rev share. There's a chance that if you don't take risk, your rev share is going to be pretty low. So you have to be aware of that as well. Uh, a, a place that's difficult to be in is when you don't have any of the orange. So if you don't have a team with experience or team members with experience that have worked together in the past and that are creating a new studio, but if your experience is lacking, that is probably the worst spot to be in uh, because you're at a place that um, with the risk involved of making a game and how difficult it is to work together for 18 months on a mobile free-to-play game, if your team has never built one, there's a very good chance that it's going to close most doors in front of you. So you're going to have to be a bit more creative on how you approach those potential deals to try to make yourself um, appealing to publishers. <clears throat> so I created a quick table. Um, this is not the end all be all table of publishers. This is an example of how you should look at publishers and their positioning and how you should look at yourself versus their positioning. Um, some of these locations, some of these spots, some of these publishers might not be in the perfect place. I did not double check everything with every publisher that's on the list. This is from past experience, past knowledge, past conversations. And of course, please do not take this as uh, the Bible of what publishers are looking for, where they are located, right? Um, but the way I look at this, I look at this in two aspects, right? Um, will publishers invest in development? That's your horizontal line. Uh, so all the way to your left is no, they will not. All the way to the right, they will invest fully. And then the participation in production. Will publishers help you produce, develop your game to bring it to a place that they can recoup as much as possible uh, their, their investment, right? So there are publishers that do a lot of participation in both production and dev investment that have been very successful, like King, Scopely, Jam City, EA Mobile, I know Playrix is going there more and more. When you look at studios that participate less in production because they have a smaller team, V3Go was like that at Magic the Gathering, at, uh, for Magic the Gathering. They would ask us to you know, work with them a lot closer on the product. They would provide feedback and producers and all that, but they did not have a full team uh, like some of the bigger publishers do. Um, and, and then when you look at less dev investment, those are publishers and there, there's a lot more there, by the way. I mean, just, those are just examples. Those are publishers that will want to see KPIs or very advanced gameplay before they will sign your game. So now you're looking at games like at companies like Superscale Network and Tilting Point. Some of them have 
scaling business models. Like I know Tilting Point will sometimes invest in development and network as well. And they have RFPs and all that. But um, a big side of their business is helping you with user acquisition, right? How to make better marketing and branding campaigns, how to look at your cost per install, your lifetime value, your return on investment so that your game can be successful, right? And they help you tweak and improve that with their team, their technology, and their experience. Um, so these guys, they cannot invest in your game before it's ready to go because otherwise their value is not brought to, to the full, to the full uh, spectrum. Uh, Come to us is also one of these studios, a uh, publisher out of Korea. They are the makers of Summoner's War and uh, they used to be uh, more aggressive in investment, but obviously um, as the market and competition has tightened, it's very difficult to ship a successful game. So they are taking a bit less risk. These things might change. Those publishers might move quadrants, but what you can see is that there's one quadrant that people rarely go, which is, no dev investment and full participation in production. It would be very awkward that a publisher that does not provide you uh, participation in, in development fees, right? So give you money for the game and then take over your production. Uh, so I think it, it's weird that it's there un unless it's done as a consultancy or as a help and backup and it's, requested and welcomed by the developers since you're doing most of the investment. So I think here, what's important for you to look at is those publishers are probably the top publishers people want to work with in the mobile industry. There are more, I'm missing for sure a lot of them, but I think what's important to look at here is that the more the publisher will invest in the dev, the more they will invest in production, the less share the studio will have, right? Because they are so invested, they need to recoup that investment. And that investment will be recouped as a percentage of royalty and rev share. It is totally normal. However, as a studio, your leverage is, do you need as much participation and do you need as much investment? The less you ask for, the better chance you have to have a bigger share of that pie. However, success is the most important thing because if you're not successful with your game, no matter the size of your pie, you're not going to make any money. So be aware of your strengths and weaknesses. Be aware of what you can offer. And then as you can offer more, ask less. And if you can't offer much, then they expect to get a lot of help, but very uh, few uh, share of that pie. Ultimately, if you want to sign with any publisher and, and, even more so with the publishers on the previous slide because they are such a massive uh, companies and game, companies that have shipped successful games. Ultimately, it's all about the game. And what I write here is that in a sophisticated market, the product needs to shine first and foremost. So um, coming in and talking KPIs or installs or star ratings or, or whatever, if the game's not fun, if the game's not engaging, none of this will matter. So uh, the way I look at this is when you're pitching to publisher, regardless of your material, right? You can have a paper pitch, a prototype, a demo, a vertical slice, some videos, regardless of that, you need to know your game inside out and be prepared to show why it's worth it. And when I say know your game inside out is core loop, meta loop, what happens after 180 days of gameplay? What does a player do, right? All these things are super important for you to know and to be able to communicate to the publisher because a publisher will work a forecast, will work a P&L on the game. And, and to do that, they need to understand what the game is about. So some, some pointers, some, some key points to look at. Those are not the end all be all, but uh, a fully developed meta and core loop, okay? So how will your game retain users months over months, right? So, and then year over year. So if you look at the top games, they've been out there for years, Clash Royale. I'm still playing it to this day. I think I've been playing four or five years. I don't even remember how long I've been playing it, but I play it every day. So it's not only about what, what's my day one retention and day 14. You cannot plan a good game by talking day one, day 14 and day 30. 
those are showstoppers, right? I mean, right away, the showstopper. But I mean, any publisher, if you tell them my day one retention is 20, but my day 180 is 12, and there's a chance he's still considered. I've never seen a game like this, but he would still consider it, right? So those early KPIs that we were looking at five years ago are not irrelevant, but they are close to it. So be mindful of your CPI for the genre that you are building, right? So don't only think of yourself, meaning don't only think of this is what my game can generate. Also look at, to, at what your game might require, right? So my game can generate this in KPIs, but how much does it cost to bring a user in that funnel of KPIs? Regardless of it, if your lifetime value at 180 days is $5 and the cost of acquisition is $12, you're in a losing game regardless. So be mindful of CPIs, work with marketing friends, work with friends in publishing, work with whoever you know that can get you an idea of what your CPIs are going to look like and then present that to publishers, communicate that to publishers, talk with them about it. They're gonna to wanna to run their tests. They're gonna to wanna to do you know, all that on their own. However, from knowing that you are talking about it, it makes them aware that you are interested and that you're also looking at those numbers because you're looking at the success of both parties, not just yours. Know how to build layers of player needs versus features right so build and know your tower of want so i don't know if you know what the tower of want is but look up ethan levi or levy i don't know how you pronounce his last name uh but uh, there's a reference on youtube about the tower of want meaning every time you do something in a game you want to achieve a goal once that goal is achieved that goal only unlocks a deeper goal and a deeper goal so if you look at games like uh, Clash Royale is a good example. People want to collect cards. And then when they collect cards, they want to play their cards. And when they play their cards, they increase level. So as you increase level and you open up clan wars and you open up uh, more, more uh, enemies to fight, more, more people to play against, all of a sudden strategies change. And those strategies make you require different cards. So you need to collect more cards. So it's all about having different needs and different desires on each level of the game that will bring you to a place that you're gonna to continue to collect, monetize, spend on the game, whatever is needed or stay longer in the game because the longer you are engaged, the more likely you are to monetize or bring people in that will. So your post-launch post content also needs to be ready. So when you talk to a publisher about your own game or in an RFP where you're you know, creating a pitch, you need to show them that you understand that live ops is critical to the success of the game. How do you do that? Show them a live ops roadmap. Show them your post-launch content and show them that you're planning and that you have ability to adapt to the different reactions of the players, right? If your goal is to create guild, uh, PVP mode and multiplayer mode, quickly after the game, but then you realize that all people want to do is PVE, have different events and play against uh, the AI. I mean, don't stubbornly continue in that direction. You got to be able to adapt to that. However, adaptation is only part of the skills that you need to have in live ops. You also need to be able to uh, have a previous plan in a previous direction that you're saying, this is what we believe today is the best path forward for this game. Know and show that you know your audience, right? You're building a game for who? It's super simple. Most of the time, when you have less experience, people build their games for themselves, their friends. Hopefully, people in the market are like you and your friends, and your market is bigger than nine people. But it happens that people build games that are just for them, and it turns out nobody is quite interested in playing that game. So it has to be very careful and you have to really thoroughly evaluate your audience to figure out uh, what they need, uh, what they want, and, and how you can serve them a game that will fit those needs. I'm not saying to just look at that, right? You have to design a game you're passionate for, uh, but it's important to also know what the market wants. Same thing for con uh, your competitors. You have to show in, that you know and that you, sorry, 
for competitors, it's the same thing. You have to show and you have to know, right? So do a, a survey, do a research on who the competing games are, the competing studios, the competing publishers, show some results, some KPIs, some data, anything you can find on your competition, uh, show, show it to your potential partner. What's really important is you have to be careful with how, how you talk about the competition in other games. Often I've seen people say, um, or start a conversation with, you know what's wrong with Fortnite? Oh, you know what's wrong with Clash Royale? Oh, very little. I mean, if the game is generating billions of dollars year over year, there's very little wrong with that game. So starting in a situation that you are quickly kind of bashing uh, competition is not the right place to be at in the games industry when you're pitching. I would, I would recommend looking at opportunities instead and saying that we believe that a positioning like uh, Clash Royale instead of being portrait would work great landscape. And we also think that using aliens and sci-fi instead of fantasy will work. It's completely made up, but um, it's important to show that you're looking at opportunities rather than point out mistakes that they might have done, not knowing what the team of hundreds of people working on that game has been thinking and testing and working on for the past four years. Uh, it, it shows a bit of lack of vision and, um, and focus. And we, I believe that it's important not to go in that route. Also know about the tools you can leverage in the market. If you build your game and you're doing live ops, you're gonna need tracking. You're gonna need to be able to look at what's good for your game, what's good for your users, how they're reacting. And it's important for you to show your publisher that you have that in mind. You don't have to have the final set of all the tools that you're gonna use because the publisher is gonna have tools, right? But you need to be able to show them that you need to do tracking. You need to do KPI tracking. You need to do uh, ad uh, monetization tracking, everything. And, and if a publisher asks you, what do you want to track in your game? What do you think is going to be important? Answering, we'll track everything, is not the right answer. Um, of course, you want to track and have as many data points as possible, and it's really important. However, it's also important to show the focus of what you believe are going to be the key metrics to target the success of your game. Of course, always demonstrate the monetization in your game. So if somebody is willing to invest two to $3 million in your game, they need to know how they're going to make that money back. So you monetize features and assets and things like that. But what's important is what creates the needs for the player, right? What creates the need for me to spend money in Pokemon Go, right? So show the need, show how you're going to fulfill that need, and that's your basic monetization loop and then how do you build that in multiple aspects and finally show your user journey how is a player going to play differently from day one to day 30 to day 360 and on top of that how is he going to play differently morning noon evening and afternoon right people play differently their favorite games when they're at work people play differently their their favorite games when they're at home watching tv so it's important that you show that you have something to do for the players at every moment. Otherwise, if you say, oh, there's nothing to do more than two times a day in the game, all of a sudden your engagement is low, your session is low. If your session is low, then people's, nobody's in your shop. And if nobody's in your shop, you're not monetizing. I wanted to cover some of the quick marketing KPIs to look at. Um, like we saw in the publisher slide, a lot of the publishers will wait until you have KPIs. So they will let you invest in your game all the way to soft launch so that they can look at KPIs before investing. What will they be looking at, right? So the KPIs needed now for a game to be signed go much beyond the early data, right? Before you look at retention, ArpDAO, you know, conversion rate, that was about it. Today, you're looking at retention and tutorial completion rate. You want to be at a minimum of 30 day, 30% uh, day one retention and 60% completion. And that is a bare, bare, bare minimum. And as you'll see on the next slide, it also varies depending on the genre of the game you make. Um, I mean, back in 2014, 2013, when we were talking about uh, game KPIs, we would put everything in the same bucket, right? 
What do you need as day one retention? Are day one retention, you need 50% or you need 40%. But the need for early retention is much higher in casual games than it is in mid-core games because you, you can't lose your high DAU. Casual games monetize on high DAU, while uh, mid-core games will, will monetize on actively engaged uh, DAU. Also to stand out, you need to have early time, uh, early. Also to really stand out, you, know, you need to have a really good early conversion, right? So the first time purchase needs to be at, you know, minimum 1.5% really early on so that you see that people have traction to buy in your game. The longer tail retention above day 30 needs to be 10% plus, uh, especially in the casual realm, people are looking at 14, 15, 16% day 30 plus retention. And people are now looking at day 180 retention, right? So people are, 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 are very, very patient. So um, you present somebody a game in June, they really like it, you just soft launched it. You share with them your day one retention and your, and your uh, tutorial completion rate. And they're like, wow, those are great early KPIs. Oh my God, you have 1.7% conversion on monetization. There's a chance that they're like, okay, fine. Let's talk again in three months. I want to see day 90 retention and day 90 conversion rate, right? So people are more patient because if they're going to spend $5 million in marketing with you, they want to spend it in something that they can get their money back. So how does it change from, from genres, right? So like I said earlier, the marketing KPIs needed per genre change, change drastically. So on RPGs and MMOs, it's going to be all about monetization. How much money am I making per user on a daily basis or in the long term, right? And of course, it's going to be about long-term retention. So people are looking at average revenue per daily active, like 75 cents and up, right? So long gone are the days of being happy with 15 cents on a uh, mid-core game. You need to be quite up there in RPGs and MMOs. The day 30 retention needs to be at 8 to 9% and your day 180, 2 to 3%. Those numbers are kind of low even. So you need to be aware that people need to have something to do in your game for a year, right? And, and whether it's live events, live ops, whether it's uh, tournaments, whether it's PVP versus PVE uh, collection, how long does it take to collect all characters? Regardless of that, people need to be able to play and willing to play for a year. On a strategy game, it's slightly different. It's all about social engagement and long-term retention. So what you want there is you want people to join guilds and you want people to be engaged in events and play together as a group because they push themselves to monetize together, right? So your retention is going to be critical because you need a bigger bucket of players and then you need them to join in groups. And then as a group, they actually motivate themselves to spend in your game. So the strategy aspect, uh, the strategy games require a different approach to uh, managing the game. So very important thing. Um, if you're pitching either in an RFP or pitching your own game, it takes two to make a thing go right. Um, what I mean by that is that marketing and product go hand in hand. So there's a strong chance you don't have marketing people on your team or at your studio. However, you have friends out there that can help and you should always look at how your game is going to market itself and what mar the market says it needs. So it's important for you to do that research, look at competition, look at any talks that you can see, any upcoming market things. Uh, if you're looking at an IP, look at how good the IP is, look at what's coming out in movies and Netflix and all that stuff, the shows that are coming to see where pop culture is going and where you believe the market is going. Uh, because if you have a bad market fit, with, whether it's the art, the genre, or the audience, it's going to increase your cost per install. If you increase your cost per install, you might be in a position that you cannot have an ROI that's positive, return on investment. So all of a sudden, you're looking at a game that cannot scale. Or on the opposite side, if your game is wrongly tuned and you don't generate enough revenue, same thing. Your return on investment will take longer. And if it takes longer, that means that your cycle to profit 
is longer than your competition. And if your cycle of profit is longer than your competition, they're going to be able to reinvest faster than you, outgrow you, and keep the market to themselves. So it's not important that you know all this or that you do all this for the publisher. What's important is that you just show that you're aware, that you think about these things, and that you're willing to work with the publisher to perfect that approach. <laughs> Here at the bottom, I'm showing some of the top games uh, that have perfected the fit between the game innovation and marketing strategy. Those are games that have been in the top 10, top 20 grossing for the past, you know, four, five, six years, even some of them. So it's really important to look at these games, deconstruct them, look at what made them successful, how they became successful, how their marketing are very attuned to the game itself. I mean, just look at Gardenscapes, which I think uh, was one of the first to use the fake ads, the fake gameplay ads. When you looked at the ads for um, Gardenscapes, they were nothing like the game. So you're looking at puzzles to save a guy that's drowning in a pool or things like that. And then all of a sudden you download the game and it's a match three plus city builder. So I think it, it was extremely clever to start using that because it made people want to play different versions of the games, but it mostly made them aware of the brand. And that brand awareness makes people more comfortable with it then allows them to download the game and play the game for longer even if the gameplay is not going to be exactly what they thought was promised so i want to give you some quick advice if you're just getting started um, so if you're looking for funding if you're building your first game if you're a group of guys that came out of a big uh, studio and are starting your first company as game makers um, there, there's a, there are some key points that I think are important. First of all, get some biz dev help. Um, it's a bit self-serving, but I would not be the one doing the art or the programming for the games when I was running Hibernum, the same way my programmers would not be the one doing business development. Business development is a skill, it's acquired, but it's also something you learn in school, you learn in your everyday life but it's also a talent. Uh, so it's important for you to surround yourself with people that have that talent to allow you to get all the opportunities you need to get the funding. Whether you're going to be looking at RFPs or pitching your own game, there's a chance that you don't know 10% of the publishers or studios that are willing to give money. So that this dev person, that's his entire job and role to find the people that are willing to give you money. Create your opportunities. So we, we looked at the Venn diagram of uh, team experience, KPIs, and risk sharing. When you start and when you're fresh, there's an extremely strong chance that you're going to need to create your own opportunities in multiple ways, right? Uh, there's a point below that says build prototypes, demos, videos, push as far as you can. That's one of them, right? Creating your own opportunity by bringing your game as close to the market shipability as it is, is definitely an advantage. Uh, but also look at your surroundings. Look at where people are not going for deals, right? There might be a company that's not in games that are looking to promote their brand and they have a budget. Maybe it's a small budget, but it's a budget to make a game. Your goal is to get as much experience and as much relevance as quickly as possible. And if you're less uh, in a market that is less competitive, there's a chance that you can win those pitches. So find money, find resources, ask family, ask friends, ask your government, your city. They might have programs that can give you some funding. Uh, any which way but lose, you got to get revenue or funding in the company so that you can uh, create your opportunities and go out there and push, you know, your prototypes, your demos and, and, and show people what you can do. Uh, it's the only way that you can actually get started when you're brand new. Uh, contracts are not going to fall from the sky. If you have a team experience and building something, if you have an experienced team that's working together for the first time, quickly build a prototype, show them what you're going to build because you already have that experience but you gotta push and you gotta go as far as you can knowing that it's gonna be difficult to get funding until you create your own opportunities, right? Sometimes it might be 
a local fast food chain that's looking for a quick game. They want something similar to Candy Crush because Candy Crush has candies in it. Why not put burgers and hot dogs in it? And you're like, wow, that's a great idea. Then you do a pitch. You think it's going to cost a million. Their budget is $200,000 because they don't know how expensive making games are. Uh, and it's a marketing expense for them. Then you have to show them how they're going to make money with it. And hopefully they can increase the budget and you can do your first game. Because a very important thing is do whatever you can to ship a game, right? If you haven't shipped a game and you're getting started, you've got to ship something. You're only as good as your last game, unfortunately. And, and people will give you a lot of credibility for just having been able to ship a game and close a game. I'm not saying to do live ops on your own game that you ship that's not bringing money on for two years. What I'm saying is make your game, finish it any way you can, ship it, see if it sticks. If it does not, live ops just a little bit just to show to get the full spectrum of experience. And then you're going to be able to have something to show next time you do a pitch or next time you find investors and you're going to be able to show them what you've done in the past. Also, we're linked to your biz dev person. Know the market and ask questions. Your biz dev person should be talking to all the publishers, be asking all the questions to everybody. And don't be shy to ask the deep questions, right? What are your expectations? Do you have a forecast? Do you have a PL? What's, you know, what's your IP share risk? How are you looking at Meta Loops? What's the most important thing for you for this game? Try to get that information. Try to get all the information you can because that's going to allow you to build uh, the, the, the pitch or the game, the demo, uh, as much as possible the way your publisher needs it. Um, too often times when we're pitching, we start talking about what we want to do, what we want to see. But if we take the time to listen and ask the right questions, people are going to tell you what they want to see. And then that's going to change your approach at pitching that's going to change your approach at the discussion and you're going to be able to offer them a better uh, product than you expected at the beginning. So let's wrap it up. Um, covered a lot of things. Of course, I'm going to be available for questions, comments uh, by Skype email. Also, there's going to be a session after this so where we can chat, but uh, quick points, focus on your strengths. What are you good at? What have you learned? What can you use to show any publisher or investors that you are different than others and that you, are, that you could be the best at? It's all about the game. There's never too much sharing about game features, core loops and all that. Show them what you're going to build in detail so that they can dive deep with you, but they also understand that you know. Right, Just showing that you know how to do a full game design, a full game pitch, a full game doc is very important. They might not read it all. You might be upset because they don't know what, what happened at slide 24, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. Marketing and game are inseparable. Inseparable. Marketing and game are inseparable. You absolutely have to show that you have market viability or market visibility within your team that you're looking at the games that you're looking at what's happening in the competition so that when you talk to publishers they know that you care about their challenges right this is our game it's amazing this is who we believe is going to play and i believe that there's a perfect fit for this and that reason these are the competitors in that realm that are going to be fighting with us for positioning we believe we can win because of that usb right this is why you present then all of a sudden they know you care they know you're looking into uh, the success of everybody and it gives them a better chance of wanting to finance your game. So that's it for me. This is my, <laughs> my uh, used car salesman photo uh, prior to COVID. So I had a great time filming this video for you guys. I'm hoping that you have a lot of questions and then we can cover some points that you would have. Um, please feel free to ask anything. Thank you.